And we're live. Hey, Facebook. From the boat dock. That you can see in the background right there. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's where we're at, usually, right there. Thumbs up. Thumbs up means? Thumbs up means I love you. I love you. I love you. We love everybody. <laughs> because the love of God is channeled through us. Yes. And we accept it, and we embrace it, and we ask for more of it. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to you, my love. Happy Sabbath. Where's my Bible? Come here, I grab my Bible. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, we got Bibles. My mom's here. Cindy's here. Marvin's here. You're here. I'm here. The Spirit of God is here. Mm -hmm. So we're doing pretty good. Okay, so good afternoon, Cindy. Nice to see you. Happy Sabbath. Doing Bible study a little early today because we had the Bible study uh, prepared. So we're going to do what the Lord leads us to do. So do you have any... Uh, special Sabbath blessings you want to mention? Uh, I don't Okay, know. okay, I'm just asking. I'm mm -hmm. just asking. That's a random question. Caught you off guard on that one. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Okay. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for the blessings of the Sabbath, which we have rest in the bosom of Christ, which is the safest place in existence. So we thank you that we have such a beautiful blessing. And Lord, as we pray, as we have this Bible study before us, we Ask, Lord, that you would cleanse and purge us from any unclean thing, that our hearts would be purified, that our, our thoughts and actions would be strictly focused on you in a loving way, not in a, not in a strict, scary way. And Heavenly Father, as we pray, we just simply ask that you would speak through us, that you would bless us with a double, triple, quadruple portion. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for your hands of protection. See us safely through this Bible study. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to talk about God's love, which is what we have been talking about for a while now. Dad? It's gr the greatest truth in all the Bible. It's the unmeasurable truth. You can't measure God's love. Every facet of every doctrine points to somehow, some way that God is love. And so today we're going to talk about God's love, which is the strength of the sanctuary. This is kind of like a second part to the last Bible study, which is God's love was the beauty of the sanctuary. And that kind of set the tone for this Bible study because as we looked at the sanctuary, we saw that every facet of it, from the items to the offerings to the feast days or the appointed times, all of it pointed to Christ. It was very beautiful truths that caused us to understand who Christ was on a deeper level, which in this beautiful puzzle, this should draw our hearts closer and closer to God as we see the plan of redemption laid out in a more clearer way to us. Today, we're going to talk about the strength of the sanctuary. And, of course, our lead text is absolutely 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. We said our prayers. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you, Joe Jack. Good to see you, Mom. Good to see you, Russell. Everybody else, I can't see your name, so I'm sorry. But I'm saying hello to you, even though I can't see you. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says this. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. We know this. This is the principle of being considerate, considering others more important than you consider yourself. This is how God operates. All created beings, God considers more important than he considers himself. Psalm chapter 18, verse 30, God is perfect. And Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 is God is unchangeable. So this love of God has to be perfect and it has to be unchangeable. It cannot be uh, surrounded by a set of circumstances which causes God to change his mind. So when God says he loves you, he means it forever, and it's perfect. So God's perfect, unchangeable love is found in Jesus Christ, our heavenly high priest. Psalm 7713. Psalm 7713 says this, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? And again, last time we saw the beautiful plan of salvation and redemption, which is completely laid out in the sanctuary, completely. Every item of the sanctuary points us to Jesus. Every offering of the sanctuary points us to Jesus. Every feast day, every appointed time points us to Jesus. And it tells us of the beautiful life of Christ. It tells us of the beautiful mission and work of Christ. It tells us of the character of Christ which is absolutely beautiful. And we read all of that in this book. And the sanctuary teaches us that Christ is the one who bears the burden of our sin on his shoulder. Just like the, the uh, priest of the sanctuary in the earth 
or the two onyx stones, that's what Christ is doing. He's bearing the burden of our sin. Christ himself offers himself completely for our sins and pays the wage that we cannot pay. Christ heals our mind and shows us the Father's love as he cleanses the sanctuary. Because if the, the, the sanctuary can't be cleansed, unless the heart of the children is cleansed, that's very important truth. And Christ, through the love of God, the sacrifice of Christ, how he offered himself, this causes mankind to trust God again. As Christ willingly laid down his life for the redemption of mankind, I now can know and trust that God loves me and is not seeking to kill me, even though I participated in the destruction of his own son. That sounds crazy. That's a, uh, that's a love that is beyond human comprehension. We'll have the rest of eternity to try to figure it out. But for right now, Psalm chapter 96, verse 6. Psalm chapter 96, verse 6 says this. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Beauty and strength. We looked at the beauty of the sanctuary last time. So let's look at the strength. And what we're going to come to see is that the strength of the sanctuary is found in the oil. That's so important that the strength of the sanctuary is found in the oil. Listen to this, saints. Listen to this, virgins who are seeking to have oil to prepare them for the second coming. The strength of the sanctuary is found in the oil, which is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Here we go. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And when we understand the oil in the sanctuary is actually part of a system that God gives us, that's very important, that the oil in the sanctuary is part of a system that God gives us. And how the oil is poured out, when it's poured out, is actually how the Spirit is poured out and when the Spirit is poured out. That's so important that the strength of the sanctuary is the oil. It's the Holy Spirit, how it's poured out and when it's poured out so that we can, by faith, follow the divine pattern of the sanctuary because that's the strength of the sanctuary is the divine pattern God gave us in the understanding of the oil so that we could walk in the spirit with confidence. Christ is seeking to, right now, on a regular basis, pour into us his Holy Spirit so that we can, on a regular basis, receive the Spirit in greater and greater measures. This is all done by faith. This is not works, right? The Bible study is about faith in the system that God created. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Here we go. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. We have a high priest. Last Bible study, go check it out, the beauty of the sanctuary. That set the tone for this Bible study, which shows, yes, we do have, absolutely, a high priest who's working in the heavenly sanctuary ministering for us right now. And we need to understand that whatever the earthly priest did is what the heavenly priest, Jesus Christ, is doing. That's so important that whatever the earthly priest did is absolutely what Jesus Christ, our heavenly high priest, is doing right now. Exodus 30, 7 and 8. Exodus 30, Exodus 30, 7 and 8 says this. Exodus 30, 7 and 8. And Aaron, that's the high priest. Aaron was the high priest. And Aaron shall burn there on sweet incense every morning. And when he had dressed the lamps, that's the candle, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at evening, he shall burn incense upon it. 
a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Every morning, what did the high priest do? He prepared the lamp with oil to light the candlestick. Every evening, he did the same thing. So every morning and every evening, the priest is trimming the lamp and filling it with oil. And if the earthly priest did it, the heavenly priest is doing the same thing. Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. Here we go. Revelation chapter 1, verse 20 says this. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in thy right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou saw are the seven churches. So what does the candlestick represent in the sanctuary system? It represents the churches. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 11. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 11 says this. Then I answered and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick? Now we're talking about the sanctuary with the candlestick. And it says, and upon the left side thereof. And I answered again and said unto him, What are these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? This is very important because in vision, Zechariah sees the candlesticks and he sees these olive trees. And these olive trees are pumping golden oil into the candlestick. We know that that candlestick represents the church and we know that that oil represents the holy spirit so revelation chapter 1 verse 20 when we read that the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks the seven churches are the seven angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches very important christ our heavenly high priest in the morning and in the evening is absolutely taking the oil and trimming the candlestick. He is looking for people who in the morning will receive the Spirit. He is looking for people who are in the evening will receive the Spirit. This is how the sanctuary system works. This is how the strength of the sanctuary works. It's all in the oil and how Christ ministers the oil into his churches. A very, very present truth. Very, very present truth. Exodus chapter 37 and 8, we saw Aaron, literally Aaron, this typological high priest of the earth, every morning trimming the lamp, every evening trimming the lamp so that the oil and the wick could be fitted so that the candlestick could burn bright. This is where type meets anti-type. This is the system that God created so that we could understand what Christ is doing in the heavenly sanctuary. The priest cares for the lamps every day, morning and evening. This is a continual responsibility. Every morning, the priest would trim the wicks and keep the lamps filled with oil, checking them again and again every evening, every morning, to make sure that they're burning brightly. This is, ex this is exactly what Christ does with us if we allow him, right? Are we willing to believe that the type is an understanding of the anti-type. Are we willing to understand that the earthly sanctuary is an example for us to learn of what the heavenly sanctuary is doing? Because in Revelation chapter 1, we see Christ walking around the candlestick as a priest, trimming the whip, filling the lamps with oil for his people to burn bright continuously. This is absolutely what happens every day in the heavenly sanctuary. Christ is looking to give fresh oil in the morning. Christ is looking to give fresh oil in the evening. What is the oil going to do? Exodus 27, 20. Exodus 27, 20. Here we go. Exodus 27, 20. And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring the pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. This is very important that the oil cause the lamp of the children of Israel to burn continuously always. That's what Christ is seeking to do in his people. 
He's seeking to transfer the Spirit into us every morning, every evening, so that the light of truth can burn continually. And so the Spirit can reproduce in us the life of Christ, the mature fruit of the Spirit. And this is what we see in Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. We see the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins. The five foolish understand the oil and how to maintain it, and the five foolish do not have any oil. Matthew 25, verses 1. Matthew 25, verse 1 says this, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins. That virgin stands for a church, which took their lamps. That lamp represents a Bible, and went forth to meet the bridegroom. The bridegroom is Jesus Christ, coming at the second coming. The five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom carried, why Jesus took longer than expected, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, at earth's darkest hour, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out but the wise answered and said not so least there be not enough for us and you but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves why would they say that why would they say give us of your oil and then they say we can't you need to go to somebody who sells the oil that's very important and while they went to buy the bridegroom came and there and they that were ready went with him to the marriage, to the, and the door was shut. And afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us also. But he answered and said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour, wherein the Son of Man comes. This is very important, especially for those of us who live at the, uh, the precipice of earth's final moments and the second coming. This parable is designed to get us to understand the oil and the sanctuary system we see ten virgins these people this ten virgins represents those espoused to christ we see the lamps that lamp represents the bible we've done studies on this plenty of times we know this right the bridegroom is christ and the the virgins who have the lamps have their bibles they're waiting for christ they're waiting for the second coming and what do we see? We see five wise and five foolish. Five wise have oil, they have the spirit. And the five foolish, they have no oil, they have no spirit. So we see a group of professed believers, professed Christians, all having their Bibles, all waiting for the second coming. And all of them are fast asleep. And when midnight comes, that's earth's darkest hour. Everybody wakes up, and everybody sees their great need of the Holy Spirit. And what happens? Matthew 25, 8. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. This is very important. The five wise virgins have oil, which prepares them for the second coming. Right? Ephesians 4, chapter 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. That day of redemption is the second coming. And we see the five foolish virgins. They don't have oil. And they try to go to the wise and say, give us of your oil. But the, the wise virgins don't have the capacity to give oil. Why? Because it's the priest, the heavenly high priest, who puts the oil into the lamp. Obviously, the foolish had never had the spirit poured into their lamp. That's very important. And when the wise say, go to him that sells, they can't buy any. There's a very specific reason why they can't buy any. Because the time of probation has closed. Christ is no longer ministering in the heavenly sanctuary, and he's no longer pouring oil into the candlestick. I'm going to prove it to you right now. Amos chapter 8, verses 11 to 13. Ye 
Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. Amos chapter 8, verses 11 says this, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro, and seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. So we see fair virgins here. And what are they doing? They're thirsty. Why are the fair virgins thirsty? John chapter 4 verse 14. John chapter 4 verse 14 says this. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. What is the water that Jesus gives that causes us never to thirst? John chapter 7, 37. John chapter 7, verse 37 says this. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Who Believing on Jesus Christ, you receive the Spirit. For the Holy Spirit was not given yet, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the thirsty virgins are in the time of a famine, where they can't get the water. They're thirsty because they never received the water that Jesus gives. What was the water that Jesus gives? The Holy Spirit. So in Amos chapter 8, verse 11 to 13, what do we see? Amos chapter 13 says this. Thirst. They're fainting for thirst because they don't have the Spirit. They don't have the water of Christ. They don't have the oil. The foolish virgins are the thirsty virgins. And they can no longer find oil. They can no longer find water. They can no longer find the Spirit because Christ is no longer officiating as the heavenly high priest pouring the oil into the candlestick. Revelation 18, 13. Revelation chapter 18, verse 13. Here we go. Close of probation. Revelation chapter 18, verse 13. And cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat. No more to be found at all in the this is sanctuary language with sanctuary items. Revelation 18, 23. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. We know what the light of that candle was. That was when the priest poured the oil in the candle and it, because it caused a perpetual burning to take place, which is the life of Christ in us. When the close of probation comes, there is no more the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. This is the close of probation. This is when Christ stops officiating as heavenly high priest. So there's no more oil. The virgins cannot find it because the one who sells it is no longer selling it. There's no wheat. There's, there's no uh, crushed oil wheat which is the fine flour which is the sacrifice of christ right there's no light of a candle there's no bridegroom there's no bride why why is there no oil why is there no bridegroom why is there no light of a candle because the work of christ in the heavenly sanctuary has come to an end revelation 15 8 and the temple that's the heavenly sanctuary and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. That's very important. We know that this is the close of probation because the plagues are falling. That's very important. And it says that no man can enter into the sanctuary. No man can enter into the temple. Who is the one that enters into the temple? The priest. And Jesus cannot enter into the temple because the time of the close of probation has come. 
The false second coming has taken place. People have been deceived. The bitter cup of uh, Numbers chapter 3 has taken place where Satan pretends to be Christ. He comes back. We've done studies on this. Go check those Bible studies out. And now the world has been deceived, and now they follow uh, the, the, the falsehood, and everyone has made their uh, choice. 144,000 have chosen truth. The rest of the world has not chosen truth, and now probation is closed because the heavenly priest has no one to save because 144,000 are living in perpetual obedience by the complete indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the rest of the world thinks that Satan is Christ and they're following him and they're not asking for repentance. So probation closes not because of some arbitrary decision God makes, but because of us, humanity, choosing not to have Christ work in the heavenly sanctuary anymore. And we see that this is the close of probation because now the plagues are falling. So this is the close of probation. The plagues are falling and the heavenly high priest is no longer officiating. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum, we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Our high priest right now is still pouring out the oil into anyone who asks. He's still officiating. He's still doing the work of a heavenly high priest, our, our great God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's still doing it. We still have opportunity to be wise virgins and receive the oil. But someday that's going to stop. And if we are not receiving this oil now, we need to do something. Luke eleven thirteen. Luke chapter 11, verse 13 says this. Luke eleven thirteen. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Spirit to them that ask him? Well, we need to ask for the Spirit. If the Spirit isn't working in our lives, causing us to let go of sin, preparing us for the second uh, coming, then we simply just need to go to the Father and ask. There's no point in looking at all the sins I've done and letting that be a weight that holds you down. You are forgiven you need to forgive yourself, and you need to allow Christ to channel the Spirit into you. That's what the, the Bible study is all about. Let go of your selfishness. Quit holding on to things that are bringing you down, and simply ask the Father to bless you, to forgive you, and to give you of the Spirit. Someday the high priest is absolutely going to stop working, and then it won't be possible then. That's very important. So now we still have an opportunity to go to Christ, who is still ministering, and receive the Spirit. There will someday be a famine in the land, and the foolish virgins who should have gotten the oil or the Holy Spirit when they could have, they'll no longer have the opportunity to do it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 says this. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the world has come. Now that seems like a separate scripture that is, doesn't make any sense. But the truth of the matter is everything that happened in the Old Testament and in the sanctuary system was something that we should learn from those of us who live at the end of time. Very, very, very important that we need to learn lessons how do I get the oil? Why do I need the oil? Matthew 25, chapter, Matthew chapter 25, verse 4. Matthew 25, verse 4. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Exodus 27, 20. Here we go. Exodus 27, 20 says this. And thou shalt command the children of Israel, the ch people of God, the wise virgins, that they bring thee pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause thy lamps to burn always. This is very important that we have this experience. And we want to move forward in this understanding of how the oil is channeled to us so that our lamps can be continually burning and so there's this process or system which god shows us in the sanctuary which gives us strength 
And it shows us that God pours out his spirit in extra measure at extra, at specific times. Now that's going to sound funny, right? But God does pour out extra measure, extra spirit, and we have biblical examples of this. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. Does God give extra oil? Does God give extra Holy Spirit? Yes, he absolutely does. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. Here we go. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, What shall I do for thee before I be taken away from thee? And Elijah said, I pray, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. He asked for a double portion of the spirit. And what happened? He received it. He received the double portion. Why? Because he asked for it. Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, If we ask for the Holy Spirit in a greater measure, we will absolutely get the greater measure. Numbers chapter eleven sixteen. 16. You want a greater measure of the Holy Spirit? Ask for it. We ask for it all the time. Numbers chapter 11, verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and I will put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. That's very important. That the Spirit is given to serve. That's what the Spirit is given to. And the Spirit can come upon you when the Lord decides that there's a work for you to do. Very important. Numbers chapter 11 verse 24. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto them and took of the Spirit that was upon Moses. And gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass, when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them as well. And they were with them that were written, but not unto the tab but went not unto the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant, said unto Moses of his young men, answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses spake unto them, Envious thou for my sake, would God that all his people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them all. We see a very beautiful truth here that this spirit is not for specific people. It's for anybody that's willing to receive it, right? There were people who were picked and appointed, and the people who God saw that they were willing to also receive the spirit, he gave it to them as well, unexpectedly. So this can happen to anybody. Moses said God wants everybody to be filled with the spirit to full capacity. And what happened when Joshua saw it? Joshua had the spirit of jealousy. Just like the disciples, when they were saw seeing somebody else preach the, and healing in the name of Jesus, they said, Lord, we should forbid him. And what did Jesus say? He said, don't forbid people that are doing the work of God. Right? We got to be very careful that we don't let our own preconceived jealousies. And when we see people doing the work of God, it causes us to get jealous and we want to stop them. We're a team, Team Jesus. And all of us should be filled with the Spirit to full capacity, and we should all be doing the work of God because the Spirit enables us to do the work. Exodus chapter 31, 2. Exodus chapter 31, verse 2. See, I have called Bezaliel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of work. The Spirit is given to do God's work. 
That's very important. What is the greatest work that we can do is get prepared for the second coming. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is trying to do a work in us that prepares us for the second coming. And without the Spirit, we will not be ready. We saw that clearly in Matthew 25 with the foolish virgins. It's only those who have the oil, only those who have the Spirit, who are ready and prepared for the bridegroom cometh. John chapter 3, 31. John chapter 3, verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all. That's talking about Jesus. He that is from the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testified. And no man receives his testimony. He that receives his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. For whom God hath sent speaketh the word of God. For God gives not the spirit by measure unto him. Now that, that's very important. That Jesus has the spirit in an unlimited measure. Because he is the word of God. He's the mouthpiece of God. He's the only begotten son of God. His, his point of origin is divinity itself. He's the rib of God. And Christ as the channel of the spirit. Who pours out the spirit into others. Is given the greatest work to do. So the father gives Christ the spirit without limit. Because that's the work of Christ, is to pour into others the Spirit. And thus, the Spirit actually becomes the Spirit of Christ, completely making it the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of the Father united. Right? And this outpouring of the Spirit is actually displayed in a system in the sanctuary, which is where the strength of the sanctuary comes from. And the Spirit can be poured out in a double, a triple, a quadruple portion. It can be poured out in a portion that's 30-fold, 60-fold, and a 100-fold. And Jesus says in a very specific scripture, Matthew chapter 13, verses 3, that if you're willing to receive this, you have to have an ear to hear it. Matthew chapter 13, verse 3. You have to have an ear to hear this. Matthew chapter 13, verse 3. What's up, Sister Christy Simmons? Good to see you. Matthew chapter 13, verse 3. And he spake many things unto them in the parable, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them. And some fell upon the stony places where they had not much earth, and immediately they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root. They withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked. But other fell in good ground and brought forth fruit. So we see seed falling in good ground, bringing forth fruit. Some hundred, some sixty, some thirty-fold. Now, we use the biblical dictionary, and we are thinking in typological terms now, right? There's a sower, that's the God, the Father, who sends forth his word. And those of us who receive the seed, the incorruptible seed of the word of God, which is Jesus Christ in our hearts, Jesus is that incorruptible seed. When we receive that into our hearts, which is the good ground, which is the honest heart, what happens? A process takes place and the spirit falls upon us like rain, which causes the process from seed to blade to ear to corn to harvest. And the process of developing the mature fruit of the spirit takes place. Some 60, some 30, some 100. And depending upon the measure or your capacity to believe is how the spirit falls on you is your capacity to receive some 30 some 60 some 100 let's check this out right now matthew chapter 3 verse matthew chapter 13 verse 9 says this he who has an ear to hear let him hear we have to be able to receive this not everybody's going to hear it right there's a sower that's the father 
They are seed. That's the incorruptible word of God, which is Jesus Christ. The, 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 the developing of the fruit is the work of the Spirit. We know that. Galatians chapter 5, 22. And when we receive Jesus into our heart, that incorruptible seed produces the fruit of the Spirit. This is the extra measure of the Spirit producing extra fruit. And to the capacity that we believe is to the capacity that we receive. Now we're going to talk about the extra measure of the Spirit in the system that God created, which... A lot of people um, are not being taught. This is very important that this truth needs to be taught and incorporated so that the virgins can go through the close of probation and be ready for the second coming. So, when we understand the earthly sanctuary was a type of the heavenly, this is where the system of the Holy Spirit in extra measure is found. When we have to have an ear to hear this, that the earthly sanctuary was a type of of the heavenly sanctuary and how everything the earthly priest did was an example to teach us of what Jesus is doing then we can see the sanctuary tells us of extra oil was given in greater measure at specific times that sounds funny because people don't talk about it but it's true when we already saw that each morning and each evening Jesus is pouring the oil he's pouring the spirit into his people who will receive it. We saw that. Now, what we're going to do, the beauty of the sanctuary, right, has its strength in the offerings and the appointed times. Why? Why does the beauty of the sanctuary have its strength in the offerings and the appointed times? Because each appointed time required a specific offering, right? And each offering had a specific measure of oil that was to be used with the offering. And depending on the time, the oil could be flowing. And to give you a visual comparison, imagine the high priest using two gallons of oil when it came to imparting the spirit to a person. That's exactly what we're going to see in a moment. So, let's check this out. We saw the beauty of the sanctuary in the offerings and in the appointed times, right? The five offerings was the burnt offering that had oil with the sacrifice. Very important. The grain offering had oil poured out with the sacrifice. The peace offering had oil poured out with the sacrifice. The sin offering had oil poured out with the sacrifice. And the guilt offering had oil poured out with the sacrifice. This is very important because each of these offerings is directly connected to an appointed time of God. Stay with me. We're not talking about works. We're, we're not, stay with me. Because I know some people are going to start hearing the appointed times. They're going to shut their ears and they're going to go. This is why Jesus says, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Stay with me. I know this can be hard to receive. It was hard for me to receive. When I heard this truth, it was very, very hard for me to receive it. But I put it to the test. I saw it to be true. And I can tell you this, that the appointed times are designed to teach us. The appointed times are designed to teach us that at each specific appointed time, a specific offering is made in addition to the morning and the evening. Which, what does that mean? That means that the appointed times, God is giving us extra oil with the sacrifice besides the oil at the morning and the evening. So, which means God is giving us extra measures of the Spirit at specific times that He chose. Very important. So, as we look at the appointed times, let's remember that we're looking at oil. We're looking at the Spirit. We're trying, we're not trying to establish our own works. That, that, that's garbage. That's old covenant. We don't do nothing. <laughs> nothing. We, we don't do works around here. We don't do works around here. We rely on Christ for everything. Right? But we want to look at these appointed times and offerings at the oil, which is a system of how the Spirit is poured out. This is very important. Because if we look at the offerings and appointments as something that we do, that's simply going to puff us up. And that's going to cause us to have the old covenant mind where we're doing the righteousness. That's not what we do. Right? We want to look at the oil as a system of the Holy Spirit being poured out to God's people in greater measure. That's what we want to do. 
So let's look at the appointed times and the offerings, but we're looking at the oil. That Stick with me on this. It's so important. The appointed times with the offerings, looking at the oil. For example, we know every morning and every evening, the high priest is pouring the oil into the candlestick. That's us. Jesus, every morning and every evening, when we do devotions, every morning and every evening, we say, Lord, we're ready to receive the oil, and we receive it. And we walk in the grace of Christ's strength every morning and every evening. Every Sabbath had a specific offering, right? On the Sabbath, it wasn't just the morning and the evening offering. There was two lambs with meat and drink offerings plus the morning and evening sacrifices. So there was an extra blessing of the Spirit because there was extra oil, right? That The two lambs, the meat and the drink offerings, that had a specific amount of oil plus the morning and evening oil. This is why the Sabbath has such a blessing because we get the Spirit of Christ in extra measure. That's the truth. We all know this about, we know this truth about the Sabbath. We know that. That's If you've been with us and, and you're in the present truth movement and you're part of the three angels movement, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know that's true. But the other appointed times have the same blessing. For example, Passover had two bulls, a ram, seven lambs, one kid, and a Passover lamb. How many sacrifices is that? That's at least 12. How much oil is that? That's a lot. That's a lot more extra measure of the Spirit, right? Each sacrifice had oil mingled with it so that the Spirit was given out in a greater measure. That's symbolically what it means. We're looking at the oil, not works, right? The uh, unleavened bread had two bulls, a ram, seven lambs, a kid, plus the morning offerings, right? This took place for seven days. There's two bulls, one ram, seven lambs, one kid, plus the morning offerings. This was consecutive for seven days. This means that the, sp the Spirit is poured out in a great abundance for seven days. That's very important. Pentecost had two bulls, a ram, seven lambs, a kid, a morning offering. What does that mean? That means that the Spirit is being poured out in greater measure because the oil is being poured out in greater measure. The Feast of Trumpets had a bull, a ram, seven lambs, one kid, the morning and the monthly offering. That's extra offerings, meaning extra oil, which means extra Spirit at these specific appointed times. Very important. Right? The, 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 the Day of Atonement was a bull, was one ram, was seven lambs, was one kid, was two goats, right? This is typology, teaching us how and when Christ is going to bless his people in greater measures. And you can only get these greater measures by obeying what Christ is doing in the appointed times. The same way that you can only get the Sabbath blessing on the Sabbath, is the only way that you can get the appointed time measure of the Spirit at the appointed time. It's not about works. It's, we're not, not, none of that. This is about when the Spirit is poured out in extra measure. And there's a big one. This Feast of Tabernacles is when the Spirit is poured out in the greatest measure. And this last Feast of Tabernacles, we didn't tell anybody. We, we, we by God's grace and mercy, we desired to keep it. And we had such a measure of the Spirit, it's undescribable, uh, right? This set of offerings for the uh, Feast of Tabernacles is every day for seven days. So as I describe the sacrifices, we're not looking at the sacrifice. We're looking at the oil associated with the sacrifice, right? The Feast of Tabernacles has 13 bulls, two rams, 14 lambs, one kid, plus the morning, right? That's like 30-something sacrifices. Each, of the, each one of those animals has a specific amount of oil, and this happened for seven days, right? Each day, there was one less bull. And so we see this large amount of offering, but it's not the offering, it's the oil. <laughs> How much oil is associated with 13 bulls, two rams, 14 lambs, one kid? one goat and one morning sacrifice, 
That's a very, very large amount of oil. Leviticus 14, 15. Leviticus 14, Leviticus chapter 14, verse 15. And the priest shall take some of the log of oil. That log of oil was two gallons of oil. That's a lot of oil. This, this is what he does with it. And the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it in, his, in the palm of his left hand. And the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand and shall sprinkle the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. And the rest of the oil that is in his hand, the priest shall put at the tip of, his, of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed and upon the thumb of the right hand and upon the great toe of his right foot and upon the blood of the trespass offering. And the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hands, he shall pour upon the head of him that is to be cleansed. That's very important. That there is somebody to be cleansed. Who is to be cleansed? I am to be cleansed. Me, Mr. Brad, you're to be cleansed. And the priest has this large amount of oil. That's Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Compared to us, that's like two gallons of oil. And he takes the oil and he, what does he do? He puts it on my ear. That means that the Spirit should guide everything I listen to. He puts it on my thumb. That means the Spirit should be with me in everything I put my hand to. And he puts it, he puts the oil on the big toe. That means everywhere my foot sets itself to go should be guided by the Spirit. And then the rest of the oil was dumped on the head. That means every single part of my life, my entire life, should be spirit-led, right? Everything I hear, everything I do, everything I put my hand to, everything I put my foot to, my entire life should be spirit-led, which is what the oil in the sanctuary is all about. This is the strength of the sanctuary. This is what we should be doing. This oil, this Holy Spirit, this is the strength of the sanctuary. It's to consecrate our entire life that's what it is and when this becomes a lifestyle what happens i'm sealed with the name father this appointed time is a system everybody looks at the sacrifices everybody looks at the days and some of these days are holy and true and right and just and we we we, we if the father says to keep them and honor them we should but we're not talking about that at the moment we're talking about the oil which is a system which we obey and we walk by faith in, will bless us constantly by receiving the Spirit of God constantly. This is so important. God created a system where we can purposely and intentionally look to him to receive the Spirit. We can purposely and intentionally look to him to receive the Spirit, and we can look and purposely look to him to walk in the spirit so we're always looking to god to receive and to accept and to walk in that for what to overcome sin that's what the spirit does helps us to overcome sin to overcome satan to overcome temptation to overcome the world to guide us in all truth to convict us of sin to help us make godly judgments that's what this system of pouring the Spirit out is there to do so that as we day by day in the morning receive the Spirit at the evening receive the Spirit when we ask for it that's the key you got to ask for it we get a double triple quadruple portion on the Sabbath and there are other appointed times as well where we can receive the Spirit some 30 some 60 some hundredfold to help us overcome sin Satan temptation and the world first John chapter 4 Verse 4. First John chapter 4, verse 4. What's up, Brother Justin? Happy Sabbath, brother. First John chapter 4, verse 4. First John chapter 4, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who is in you? That's the Holy Spirit. And greater is he that is in you. And he helps you to overcome sin. He helps you to overcome Satan. He helps you to overcome uh, temptation. He helps you to overcome the world. 
John 16, 13. Here we go. John 16, 13 says this. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. That's what the spirit does. He guides you into all truth. And imagine being guided in truth in greater and greater measure so that you can come into the fullness of the man of God so that you can do the works of God and bear the mature fruit of the spirit. Bearing the mature fruit of the spirit can be a heavy weight because it's living the life of Christ, right? John 16, 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is important for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. That's the Holy Spirit. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. This is what the Spirit does. This is what the Spirit is trying to do. The Spirit is trying to bless us in greater measures with victory over sin, self, Satan, and the world. The Spirit is trying to give us victory and guide us into every truth that will prepare the 144,000 who follow the Lamb, who follow truth, whithersoever he goes. And the Holy Spirit wants to convict us of sin so that we can acknowledge it, confess it, repent of it, and be healed from it. The Holy Spirit is seeking to guide us in all righteousness and help us make godly judgments. Now, I'm sure someone is thinking, and I, I, I thought this too, so I, I, I understand why some people can think this, that the appointed times and offerings are different than the oil being poured out in the candlestick. That's, that's what I thought, and I can understand why people think that. That the appointed times and the offerings and that oil is different than the oil that is poured out into the candlesticks. Well, check this out. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We are the living sacrifices. And each morning, each evening, Christ is looking to mingle the oil with the living sacrifice. At each appointed time, Christ is looking to mingle the oil with the living sacrifice in greater measure, in greater measure, in greater measure, sometimes in a very great measure. Sometimes in a very great measure. And the offerings and the appointed times, they are a system. People don't look at the principle, they look at the situation and say, this has been done away with. Well, we have preconceived ideas. We're thinking with carnality. We're not letting the Spirit of Christ guide us in all truth. And there's a principle in the offerings, the principle in the appointed times, and that principle is how the oil is poured out in greater measure. This is very important. Greater and greater measure so that we can walk in the Spirit in greater and greater capacity. That's, that's the strength of the sanctuary. And to the capacity that we believe is to the capacity that we receive. What we're talking about is a system. It's a principle of a system of receiving the Spirit of God as a lifestyle so that we can be sealed. That's what this is. This appointed time and the oil being poured out is a system and a principle that God's people are given so that our eyes, morning and evening, Sabbath and appointed time, new moon, not because we're establishing works, but this causes our eyes to be looked upon this heavenly high priest who's looking to pour his oil, his spirit into us in extra measure. Leviticus 26, 2. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Leviticus 26, 2 says this. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Leviticus 26, 2. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, and I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield her fruit. The Holy Spirit is the rain. That's what it is. It's the water which comes from heaven, right? It's associated with the appointed times because that's when it's poured out. 
this isn't something that we do which causes the rain to happen, the spirit to be poured out. God has specifically picked specific times to pour out the spirit. And when we obey, when we believe, we receive. The offerings and the appointed times just explain the portions and the timing. That's very important. And that's the principle behind what's happening. The appointed times and the offerings explain the portion and the timing when the Spirit is poured out in extra measure. This is the strength of the sanctuary. This is the extra oil. This is Christ in me, the hope of glory, in greater and greater measures, growing in grace and truth on a regular basis, constantly having my fix, eyes fixed on the heavenly high priest, my Savior, so that he can continually pour his Spirit in me, which we freely receive by faith, and to the capacity that we believe is the capacity that we receive. This is not works. This is faith. And the beauty of the sanctuary is seeing the life of Christ in the sanctuary. The beauty of the sanctuary is seeing the mission and the work of Christ in the sanctuary. The beauty of the sanctuary is seeing the character of God in the sanctuary. And when we see that, it's absolutely beautiful. The strength of the sanctuary is understanding how Jesus, our high priest, pours out his spirit systematically so that we develop a lifestyle of walking in the spirit. That's so important. This is not an accident. This is intentional and it's purposeful that the strength of the sanctuary is understanding how Jesus, our heavenly high priest, pours out his spirit systematically so we develop a lifestyle of walking in the spirit so that we can be sealed because that's what this whole process is about us being sealed so that we can develop the life of christ the mature fruit of the spirit so that the 144,000 can come on the scene so that the great controversy can come to an end so that we can all go home now i know a lot of people are going to say mr brad what you're saying sounds like salvation. What I, I am not talking about salvation. By grace we are saved through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Right? Romans chapter 3 verse 20. Romans chapter 3 verse 20. This is a principle of understanding how the Spirit is poured out. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Nothing that I do will ever justify me in the sight of God. It has nothing to do with what I'm doing. Right? We don't earn salvation. We don't add to salvation. We have nothing to offer God except a miserably failed life. That's the truth of the whole matter. Right? All of us are miserable poor, blind, and naked. And only Christ has the solution to the problem. All of us are miserable, poor, blind, and naked. If you don't see your miserableness, if you don't see your poorness, if you don't see your blindness, if you don't see your nakedness, that doesn't really matter. Christ says it. We just simply have to believe it. Lord, it doesn't seem like I'm blind. Lord, it doesn't seem like I'm poor. Lord, it doesn't seem like I'm miserable. It doesn't seem like I'm naked. But Jesus, you said it, so I, by faith I'm going to believe it. And what happens? When we believe the written word, the living word makes it a reality. But, right, this principle of receiving extra measure of the Spirit is not salvation. But if we don't participate in this system designed by God to give us greater and greater measure of the Spirit so that we can walk in the Spirit in greater and greater measure. If I don't participate in this system, will I receive the blessing? No. If I don't walk in Sabbath truth, will I receive the blessing from the Sabbath? No, I won't. If I reject these truths, I reject the spiritual blessing associated with them. That's the same principle of Sunday worship. right? I can't say that uh, I know about the Sabbath, but I'm going to switch it and I can do what I want with God's holy law. That's the same principle. If I know these truths and I reject them, I'm rejecting the spiritual blessing associated with them. I can't change it to another day. I can't do that. That's all, that's all God. He picked the times. He picked the blessing. He, he picked the measure. I simply believe and receive. 
And a lot of people tell Christians to stop doing Christmas. A lot of people tell Christians to stop doing Easter, stop doing Valentine's Day, stop doing all these things, and they don't give them something to replace them. This understanding of how the Spirit is poured out at a point of times in extra measure will absolutely fill the heart with God's love so that as we let go of all the paganized, uh, baptized Christianity pagan holidays, this principle, this understanding, these appointed times in the proper understanding will fill that gap in the heart for people who don't want to give up baptized paganism. That, that, that's just a fact. And we can't go around telling people to give up something without filling the void that Jesus Christ can only give. That's very, very, very important. We need to see the bigger picture, right? It's not about doing works. It's about having a spirit-filled life so that I can walk in the spirit and I can share that with others and I can show them how to do that as well. Let's see a big picture here. This is a big picture. Colossians chapter 2, 16. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 says this. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or a new boon or of the Sabbaths, right? Verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. So, don't judge people in meat and drink offerings and holidays and new moons, right? We are not to judge others, we're to judge ourselves. But this is what Paul says in verse 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holiday or of the new moon or of the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come. He doesn't say these are things of the past. He says these are a shadow of things to come. That means their future. The new moons, the meat, the drink, the Sabbath, the holy days. These are shadows of things to come. That means the future. Why would Paul say that these things are future? Luke twenty-two fifteen. Stick with me now on this one. Luke twenty two fifteen. Luke twenty two fifteen. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat of until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That's very important. Jesus speaks of the Passover in the kingdom of God. That's appointed time. That's that's the first appointed time. Zechariah. 14, 16. Here we go. Doo, doo, doo. Zechariah 14, 16 says this. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. This is in the kingdom. The Bible says we're year to year, we're going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. That's the last appointed time. Isaiah 66, 23. Look at the principle. The, the, the principle is receiving the Spirit. That we're going to receive the Spirit in specific measures, even in the kingdom of God. And they'll be surrounded by appointed times of celebration. Isaiah 66, 23. Isaiah 66, 23. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. So the Sabbath is kept in the future kingdom. And the new moon is kept as well. And you notice, right? No one ever says that we should keep the new moon now. No one ever says that. Everyone says, oh, we should keep the Sabbath because Sabbath was in the past. Sabbath is in the future, which means we should keep the Sabbath now. But no one ever says anything about the new moon, which is a symbol of the Spirit being poured out at a specific time. It's not about works. It's about when the Spirit is poured out in greater measure, right? All of that's true, that we should, the Sabbath was kept. The Sabbath will be kept in the future, and the Sabbath should be kept right now. That's absolutely true. But no one ever says Passover was for the past. 
Passover is in the kingdom, so Passover should be kept now. No one ever says that, right? No one ever says Passover was in the past. No one ever says Jesus kept the Passover and that the Passover will be kept in the kingdom. No one ever says that. There's lots of things when we put line upon line, line upon line, that don't make sense, right? We can't have a principle for one and not have that same principle for the other things that the scriptures clearly line out. I'm not saying that we should keep the appointed times as work. I'm saying that these appointed times should be honored because they're beautiful and that there's an extra pouring of the Spirit at these times. If you're gonna if you're gonna go about doing these things to establish your own righteousness, don't even bother. You're wasting your time. You're dishonoring God. First Corinthians four four. But no matter what, there is a principle of receiving a blessing by doing what's right and good in God's eyes. 1 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 1 Corinthians 4.4. 4. For I know... Maybe it's 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 2 Corinthians... 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God should shine upon them. We've been blinded by Satan. Least the true light of the good news of God should shine upon us, right? The things that we talked about are not salvation because there is no justification in the works of man, right? They are blessings which God hath ordained so that we can continually grow in grace and truth forever in the past, in the present, in the kingdom because we're talking about receiving the Spirit. We're not talking about works of men, right? Satan wants us to forget and ignore these things because he knows what a blessing they are when we receive and when we submit and we believe on them. That's very important. That's why he has created such powerful and enticing counterfeits. That's what he did. He created powerful and enticing counterfeits. So we focus on the things of the world and we miss a spiritual blessing. That's very important. Now, for people in the present truth movement, I want to ask a question. Does the latter rain or does the Holy Spirit fall all around us and yet we don't see it? Why? Why is that? How can the Holy Spirit or the latter rain fall all around us and yet we can't identify it? Leviticus 26.2. Leviticus 26.2. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reference my sanctuary. Right? These is where the blessings are. If ye walk in my statutes and do them, if ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield her fruit. That's very important that the appointed times are associated with the Holy Spirit because that's when it's poured out. We're, we're looking at the physical and not the spiritual. Jeremiah chapter 5, 24. We need to look at the spiritual and not the physical. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 24. Neither say in your heart, let us now fear the Lord our God, that giveth rain, both the former and the latter rain, in his season. This is all about God's season. He hath reserved unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. These appointed times is when the Holy Spirit comes in greater measure. And it falls all around us and we don't see it because we don't understand the spiritual principle which was given to us in physical form. I, I, I never thought that in my whole life. I guarantee you that's from the Lord right there because the physical is an example of the spiritual, right? And it's as we look into the physical, we see the spiritual understanding of what God has for us. In specific times, he pours out things in greater measure so that we can walk in spirit and in truth. Hosea chapter six, verse three. Hosea chapter 6, verse 3 says this. 
here we go. Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. Then shall ye know, if ye follow on to know the Lord, if we press on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning. The, that's a set time. That's like clockwork. You know the morning's coming. You know what's happening in the morning. He's sending forth his spirit. And he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter rain, and the former rain unto the earth. If we follow on to know the Lord and how he operates, right? we understand what he's doing and why he's doing it. That's very important. Hosea 6.3 is giving us the principle of the appointed time, the giving of the Spirit, and it's designed in a way that we recognize, which is called the latter rain. His going forth is prepared as the morning. That's like setting your time like clockwork. You know that that appointed time, the priest is going to be pouring the oil into the candlestick. You know that the sacrifice is going to be mingled with the oil. And you know that the spirit is going to be given just like the latter rain. Right? The morning is a specific time which describes the latter rain. This is a prepared system that God has set up. God has set up. We cannot change it. This is what he has decided. We look at the physical and think that the physical is not telling us spiritual truths. It is, absolutely. Right? This is a system that God has set up so that we can walk by faith in the Spirit, so that we develop a lifestyle of expecting the Spirit. Every morning, I expect the Spirit. Every morning, I receive the Spirit. Every morning, I walk in the Spirit. Every evening, I expect the Spirit. Every, every evening, I receive the Spirit. Every evening, I walk in the Spirit. Every Sabbath, I expect the Spirit. Every Sabbath, I, I receive the Spirit in greater measure. Every Sabbath, I walk in the Spirit in greater measure as a lifestyle which will seal us. Ephesians 4.30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. Don't fight the work of the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. Don't fight that work. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Denying the power of God to change us. God wants to do a work in us, but he doesn't manipulate, force, or coerce us in any way. And unless we have the desire to change, he won't force his way on us. And when he tickles our conscience and says, you know, you shouldn't be doing this, we deny the power of God to convict the heart, and we grieve the Holy Spirit, and he can't seal us for the second coming. Psalms 145, 16. Psalm 145, 16 says this. Psalm 145, verse 16. Thou openest thine hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. That's a principle. That God satisfies the desire of every living thing. Now, is God satisfying the desire for me to grow in grace and truth? Or is God allowing me to grieve the Holy Spirit because I don't want to listen to him. God will allow you to grieve the Holy Spirit because the desire of your heart is not to be converted. Right? This is a principle that God satisfies the desire of the heart. Do we desire to have a full experience with the Holy Spirit? Or will we deny God the power to work in our lives? If we have no desire to receive the Spirit in greater and greater measure, we will receive the desire of our heart. If I do not desire to have the Spirit in greater and greater measure, God will allow me to have the desire of my heart. If I hunger and thirst after righteousness, and my desire is to grow in grace and truth, and to become Christ-like and bear the mature fruit of the Spirit, and I desire to have the Holy Spirit of God in me in greater and greater measure, God will absolutely give me my heart's desire. Because it's the principle that he does. He's a good God. He gives us what we want. Even if that means sometimes that's not good for us. That's the anger. That's the wrath. 
God never forces us to do anything. But he will work in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Today we talked about principle, not works. We didn't talk about works. We didn't say that you have to keep the appointed times. We never said that. We simply looked at the beauty of the sanctuary and, whoa, that's beautiful. And then we looked at the strength of the sanctuary and said this strength, which comes from an extra measure of the Spirit, which we proved is associated with honoring what God says holy, right, just, and good. And it's this extra measure which causes us to be wise virgins, to walk in truth greater and greater and greater capacity. We simply talked about principle. We didn't talk about guilting people into doing things that they didn't want to do. We did offer a suggestion that as we offer people truth about the appointed times and tell them to come out of Babylon, uh, Babylon paganized, uh, baptized holidays, we have a replacement to give them to say, listen, this is the beauty of something that you have no idea about and this is more special than what you're experiencing now. We have something to give them. That's the principle of the Spirit in greater measure, right? We talked about the beauty of the sanctuary, which should cause us to have a desire of the revelation of the Son of God and His love in greater and greater measure. We talked about the strength of the sanctuary, which is how God systematically pours His Spirit into us in greater and greater measure so that we develop a lifestyle of expecting the Spirit so that we develop a lifestyle of receiving the Spirit, so that we develop a lifestyle of walking in the Spirit. If you have no desire for those things, they will not benefit you, right? I personally have put this to the test, and I've seen it to be true in my own life. That's why we are always asking for extra measure of the Spirit, double, triple, quadruple portion, because the Lord is seeking to give it to us. He wants to give it to us. And he does give it to us. Absolutely. We've put it to the test. We've seen it to be true. And we praise God for the beautiful truths of the principle of receiving the Spirit in extra measure. We thank God for the Spirit of Christ, which is the strength of the sanctuary. Let's pray. He loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Holy Sabbath. And we know, Lord, that you're blessing us with a double, triple, quadruple portion of your spirit. And so we simply ask that you would hold on to our hand as little children who are desperate for you. We, we, we have nowhere to go. You have the words of life. We can't do this on our own. We're miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And yet you love us. You want to clean us up. You want to raise us in grace and truth. So, Heavenly Father, we, we, we praise you. And we want to love you, though our hearts are wicked and deceitful. Above all things, change us. Give us the desire to love you. Give us the desire to want to have a life that is spirit-filled, Heavenly Father. Give us a desire to please you in greater capacity. And help us to see the beauty of the sanctuary. Help us to see the strength and receive the strength of the sanctuary, which is the, the, the life of Christ in me, the hope of glory. So we thank you, Heavenly Father. Seal us with your seal. Seal those who are watching. And hold back the winds of strife so that we may help others and steal many out of the camp of the enemy. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I love y'all. I love you.